Turn in your Bibles to Exodus 20. Now, if you study your Bible and I say turn to Exodus 20, this is, this is one of those places where when you hear the location, you know what the sermon's about. Okay? Uh, Exodus 20 is where God gives Israel the two tablets of the law. The Ten Commandments. And if you're like me, growing up, uh, I maybe heard a grand total of, I don't know, three sermons on the Ten Commandments. Okay, it's not something that people uh, tend to line up to hear. Because the church has moved away from hearing about the law in favor, and, and maybe rightfully so, in favor of hearing about the grace of the King Jesus Christ. But the thing that I want to convey to you today, there's a couple of things. One is that being, walking as a Christian requires a balance between the law and the gospel. Okay? Uh, you really cannot have one without the other. Uh, St. Paul talks about the need for the law. And, and he was, you know, I, I mean, the, the world's biggest advocate for the grace of Christ. Okay? Here's the guy that said, in Christ there is no condemnation. There's no condemnation. But he spent a whole chapter in the book of Romans talking about that. Well, if there's no condemnation, why do we need to worry about the law? Why do we need to worry about keeping the law? Well, because the law shows that we are sinners in need of grace. If you don't understand, and, and folks, I would argue that virtually every person outside this building who is not in a church today, who struggles with believing in Jesus Christ, struggles with that because they don't know that they are in need of a Savior. Whether it's they willfully just close their eyes to it, whether they weren't brought up in a house that recognized the nature of sin, the world's full of people who think they're just going to skate right through life and either get to the end and it's done. We know that's not true. Or get to the end and if there is a God, he'll, you know, it'll all be okay because he loves me. Because that's what the evangelical church in America tells people. It's true that he loves us. It's not true that he forsakes, that God forsakes his holiness in favor of that love. They walk hand in hand. So we have to back up and go, okay, you've got the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that took away our sins. The beginning of that was the revealing of the law. Paul says in Romans that the law is not sin, okay? It, it, it is not sin, but it shows sin. It's like a signpost. It points to things that inhabit our hearts that prevent us from being close to God. That's sin. So, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. Now, when we get into the law, when we get into the Ten Commandments, uh, we see that there's a division in the Ten Commandments. Okay? Uh, you will hear it referred to as the two tablets of the law. Imagine, you know, Moses gets called up to the, the top of Mount Sinai, there's this cloud full of fire. <laughs> okay? And he's gone for 40 days. And we're told the first, the 
first set of tablets were written by the finger of God. That's what the Bible tells us. God wrote the Ten Commandments on two pieces of rock. Okay. And then he turned to Moses and said, hey, you'd better get down there. You've been gone for 40 days and your people are rebelling. Take the law and go handle it. And so Moses starts on his way down and he gets about halfway down and he's seeing the people dancing and cavorting and he sees this golden calf that his brother made and he throws the tablets down. Now imagine, okay, imagine it's you coming down that mountain. All right? I'm looking for bubble wrap. I'm looking for uh, cotton. Right? Uh, I'm putting them on a cart that has uh, air suspension. These are the two most important tablets ever created. Moses is so bereft by what he sees coming down that mountain that he takes the tablets of the law and throws them to the ground and breaks them. He goes down. He has Aaron grind up the golden calf, throw it into the water, and forces everybody to drink. Somewhere in there, uh, the Levites step forward as people loyal to God and were commanded by Moses to go out and kill, to cleanse the nation of people who would rebel against God. Thousands were killed that day. And then Moses was called back up. This time, he had to, you know, God told him what to do, and he crafted the Ten Commandments. And when he came down the second time carrying the tablets, his face was so bright he had to wear a veil. Now, I say all that to get to this point because I want you to understand something. When I was a little boy and I heard that the pastor was going to talk about the Ten Commandments, the first thing that ran across my mind was, oh boy, here it comes. Okay? That's what the law means. We're in trouble. But I'm here to tell you that we don't have anything to be afraid of in the law. The law is a tool that Christians use to define holiness and to guide themselves in that holiness, in their walk with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, two tables. The first table, we're told... And I, you know, I don't know where the paragraph break was. You know, I'm not sure which page was which. But the first table is four commandments. The first four. We're going to talk about all of them. This is actually going to be a series. Today is just an overview. And the first table of the commandments have to do with how God wants us to relate to him. Okay, so... Uh, commandments 1 through 4 will deal with how we relate to God. Commandments 5 through 10 have to do with how we relate to our neighbors. Okay? Now, you may be thinking, I've heard this somewhere before. I've heard this somewhere before. Where have I heard it? Brother Clyde even preached on on this, and but where have I heard it? Well, it, to prove that God's, you know, and this is, by the way, something that the world wants to argue with us about. Okay? Well, when Jesus came, the law went away. No, that's not true. The law was fulfilled. Everything in the law was done exactly the way it should have been. We had never been able to do that 
And we haven't been able to do that apart from Jesus. Okay? Jesus fulfilled the law. He made it complete. All right? And he came to, uh, we find it twice in the Bible. I, the jury is still out. You'll remember the, uh, um, in one of the Gospels, uh, it's, it's called the, the rich young ruler, right? And this quote-unquote rich young ruler or scribe comes to him and says, what must I do to be saved, right? And uh, he, you know, says, follow these commandments. And he lists some of the Ten Commandments. He doesn't say them all. And the rich young ruler or scribe says, uh, well, I've done all these things. What else do I have to do? And Jesus says, well, there are two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. We see the same kind of exchange in other Gospels. Now, and, and, I'm, and I'm still kind of looking at the context of the Gospels to, to, in my head, figure out whether it's the same conversation. But he repeats this. When talking to Pharisees who challenge him, and a scribe, a lawyer, says, you know, who wants to test him, right? We see that. The Pharisees want to test Jesus. And so they say, well, what are the two most important commandments? Or what's the most important commandment? And Jesus says, well, the first one is, of the Lord your God, with all your heart, mind, and strength. The second is like it. Okay? And this is important. Think, think, of, think of the two tablets of the law. There's no difference between the commandments pointing us toward God and the commandments pointing us toward our neighbor. The second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, here's the next thing I want to get our heads around today. A lot of times when we hear Ten Commandments, we think of these as ten rules. That's what the Jews did. The Jews saw this and said, okay, here's ten things that we either have to do or cannot do. Okay? And their, and their approach to this was they are going to uh, meet the letter of the law. What it says, thou shalt not murder. They took that commandment at face value. So they didn't go around clubbing each other over the head or stabbing each other and killing each other. And so they could, in, in their minds, in good faith, say, well, I've never killed anybody. When it says, do not commit adultery. All right. Well, I don't cheat on my wife. I'm, I'm not an adulterer. Check the box. When it says, you will have no graven images. All right. They made a big show of going through their homes and removing anything that could be considered, um, you know, an idol or, or a piece of an idol. Right? St. Paul talks a little bit later about not even eating meat offered to idols. Okay? He says it's perfectly fine to eat the meat as long as you don't equate the meat with the idol. If you can't separate those two, then don't eat the meat. Okay. The problem is, Jesus came and in speaking to the Pharisees, he says, no, you're, you're misreading the law. When the law says, do not murder. When the law says, do not murder, and you go to your brother and holler at him and say, you fool! You've murdered him. There's no difference. You've sinned against your brother. When it says, do not commit adultery, it's not about whether you sleep with another woman. It's about when you look at the woman and you lust after her in your heart. When you, when you say, do not have any other gods before me. 
and you make a big show of getting rid of all of your idols, that's fine and dandy, but you have idols in your heart. Those are the things that you need to deal with. When it says heart, mind, strength, those are the places you find the idols and the adultery and the murder that you have to deal with. So, the Ten Commandments, really, instead of being ten specific rules, I mean, they are that, right? They are really ten guiding principles that cover a lot more ground than just murder being killing another person, for example. So let's take a look at them very quickly. And we're going to come back to these over the next couple weeks, well, after next week. Exodus 20, all these are, are right in a row in Exodus uh, chapter 20. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. What's the principle here? Well, the principle here is that God takes first place in all things at all times, period. This is not about necessarily God's little g and whether you have a little statue or whether you, you know, whatever. If you have anything, if you have anything that supersedes God in your life, the pursuit of money, we've heard, the love of money is the source of all kinds of evil. All right? It can be members of your family. consuming love that was given to me by Jesus Christ but the thing I have to always remember you know when, when I was 16 I didn't think about the love I had for my girlfriend in terms of being given to me by Jesus Christ okay and it's easy to let the love you have for something else take first place and God says in the first commandment, you can't do that, ever. So, our actions in the world should look like God has first place, right? And, and so when we, when we put it on the balance of, well, what, is it, you know, what does that mean to me? What does that look like? Okay? When other people look at you and start to... Uh, attribute reasons to things that you do. Why does he do that? The answer that comes to their mind should be because he believes in God. Because he has faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Second commandment. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. All right. What's, what's the principle? The principle is this. Human beings are easily distracted. Okay? He just said, don't have any other gods before me. But he's got to reinforce that. Don't have anything around you that would distract you or pull you away from me. Okay? Because you will have a hard time keeping the first commandment if you don't keep the second commandment. All these commandments are intertwined with one another, right? When, when, I, when I learned the Ten Commandments as a 7, 8, 9, 10 year old, right? I'm in Sunday school, I'm in catechism class at, at the Lutheran church that I went to, and we had to memorize all these things. And, you know, it, it's very easy to, you know, the way we teach them, you, you pull them apart, right? 
Here's the first one, you spend a week talking about the first commandment. And then here's the second one, you spend another week talking about this one, and you don't see how they interweave. Well, they do interweave. And here is a great example of that. You're not going to be able to keep the first commandment, have no other gods before me, without the support of the second commandment. Get rid of things around you that would distract you from following God, from having faith in His Son. Okay? Third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay, now something that I, I want to draw your attention to, I've got to go back to the second commandment just briefly, but it ties to this one. Here's that weaving again, okay? God told you, I am a jealous God. I can't tell you the number of times in a Bible study when I look at things and go, God, why did you do that? And then you try to follow it back logically, right? And it comes back to, because I am a jealous God, I demand to be first. And he means it. Okay? When we have arguments, when we're, when we're out in the world and people who are not believers want to talk about, well, he said, don't murder anybody. The, the Israelites went in and, and, and killed all those people. All right? You can do the dance. The bottom line, I am a jealous God. What I want comes first. What you want, people, comes second. <coughs> Always. And that's hard, right? Original sin plants in our hearts the notion that we're the most important thing in the world. And we spend the rest of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ trying to push that idea out. Right? That's, that's the thing that makes Christianity so countercultural. Alright? We have to go to the very root of what we are as human beings and we have to push it out. We are not the most important thing. God is. Third commandment. He's so important. You'd better not even misuse his name. Why? Because his name has power. Where does the power come from? It stems from who he is. I am who I am. The name of God. Okay? So, when we use God's name or image or anything else about God to curse somebody, driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, and I will testify in my younger years, I'm a little bit better about it these days, but in my younger years, and guys, you know, and how did the Jews handle this? Oh, well, let's, we're, you know, we're not even going to say the name, right? And so we come up with Jehovah or some other thing. Guys, this isn't about the letters in a row that you use. This is about the person of God. And if you call upon him and damn somebody else, you are misusing his name unless you really mean it. And it's his will. You can't do that. Okay, so the, there's a broader idea at work here. It's not just don't say these, you know, eight letters or whatever. Be careful what you do with the power that comes in my name. In fact, we know there's power in the name because don't you even sing a hymn that says that? And what's the name now that we hold so dear? Jesus. And there's power in his name. Because he's the son of God. That's part of the proof. 
God says, I'm a jealous God. Don't misuse my name. His son comes along and says, to prove that I'm his son, my name has power. Use it to follow me. Use it to protect yourselves against the enemy. Use it to bless others. The fourth commandment, remember, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, let's understand this. This is important. It's so important that Jesus had to address it. Okay? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay? God is a God of order, right? He makes order out of chaos. He turns to the people that he created and said, you go make order out of chaos. That's called work. My pattern, by the way, God, you know, when you're talking about this with other people, you know, and you'll hear all kinds of crazy things. Well, you know, why do we have to Sabbath? Well, we have to Sabbath because God got tired. No, he didn't. God can't get tired. Don't say that. God didn't get tired. God created a pattern because he knew we would get tired because we aren't God. He made the Sabbath for us. Okay? And because he gave it to us, it's holy. Which is, and there's, there's a nice turnaround here, okay? Because then, here's this holy day set aside once a week. Now, if we choose to come to God's house on that day and worship God, we are what Peter called acting as a living sacrifice. We are choosing to use our time and our talents and our resources for the benefit of God's people. Okay? That's the purpose of the Sabbath. Yes, it's about rest, but it's also about giving God's people the opportunity to have uh, or to give a sacrifice back to God. Because he loved you so much. Four commandments, all talking about how we relate to God the Father. Let's move on. Fifth commandment Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What's the principle? There are people that go before us. Every family has that set up because if you're a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent, you have gone before. And God says, you know what? You won't, you are where you are on your own. John Paul is not where he is just because he's John Paul, although he thinks that is the case. All right? And that's okay, because when I was his age, I thought the same thing, too. And that's what we all tell our grandchildren and children. Oh, you're so special. But then you get a little older. All right? And you realize, I'm here because of what my parents did. I'm here because of what my grandparents did. And there's a direct line between me and my grandparents in my life. And the blessing that I've had. God says, honor that. Honor the people that went before you. 
Now, there's all sorts of difficulties that come because sometimes our parents aren't very good. We'll, we'll talk about that in a couple weeks, I'm sure. But that does not, that does not take away that in order to be obedient, you have to honor your father and your mother. Because very plainly, without them, you wouldn't be here. Period. You shall not murder. Chapter 20, verse 13. Not murdering. And this is something that Jesus dealt with directly by way of example, right? He was talking to the Pharisees. Not murdering another human being isn't simply about not taking harmful action against them. We are to value and esteem human life. We are to be proactive in the way we support one another. The way we build each other up. Okay? When we have thoughts, when we harbor hatred against other people, for whatever reason, we're violating this commandment. Plain and simple. Well, what about my enemies? Right? That's, that's what, that's what the, the folks ask Jesus. What, what, what if he's my enemy? And he said, let me tell you what to do for your enemies. Pray for them. Okay? Love them as you love yourself. If you would pray for yourself in a situation, pray for others. Pray for your enemies. Is that hard? Of course it is. Again, you're running counter to what inhabits the human heart naturally. You shall not commit adultery. <clears throat> What's the principle? The principle is this. God is faithful. And we are to be faithful as well. Period. God is faithful. We are to be faithful as well. By learning faithfulness in our marriages, right? And that was, that was a pretty straightforward uh, example that he could offer to people, right? Yep. God is a thinking God. He doesn't do anything without purpose. Okay, you've got this relationship that's central to your earthly life. If you learn to be faithful in that relationship, a couple things happen. One, you will learn the importance of faithfulness to me. Okay, and that, by the way, is the most important lesson we can get. But also, if you can be faithful to your spouse, you can learn how to be faithful in all of your relationships. Your word means something. The covenants you make with others mean something. All right? If we treat them like they're disposable, if we treat our word like it's something that we have for convenience, Oh, I'll tell them whatever I need to tell them to, to get what I want and then move on. Okay? We're violating this commandment. Whether it's in business, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in parenting. Okay? There is a broader principle at work here. You shall not steal. Let me make this simple. What's the principle? Everything you have is God's. Everything you have is God's. If you take another man's time and don't recompense him for it, whether it's as a friend and you listen, or whether it's as an employer and you pay somebody for their time, if you steal something from him, an item, you are taking what God gave him. So you are stealing from God. All right? There's nothing that you could steal that isn't God's. I am the master of the cattle on a thousand hills. I look out my back, my backyard in New Liberty. And I have a very picturesque 
Uh, you know, Chris, Chris may not think so because he just looks at it and thinks about it as a, you know, as a part. I look at it and go, you know what? This is what God was thinking about when that psalm was written. And there's, there's hills that overlap each other, right? And, it, it, and as far as the eye can see, and I see, you know, Chris's cattle run out, and he comes out and feeds them in the morning about 7.30, and they start running in, you know, and I, and I, and, you know, I am the master of cattle on a thousand hills. What could you give me? Said God. Don't steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Verse 16. Principle. Here it is. Words matter. Words matter. We have, we have gotten to a point in our society where people believe that what you say just doesn't matter. Open up Facebook. Open up Twitter. Watch the television. And the words people use, we're redefining. Words don't matter. You can redefine what a woman is. You can redefine what a man is. It doesn't matter anymore. God says differently. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So the specific is, don't lie about the guy next door in order to gain an advantage. Okay, that's, that's the intent of the rule. But the principle here is, your word matters. What you say to people matters. Okay? The definitions under which you live matter. When you tell somebody, Well, yeah, I was, I was born a man, but now I'm a woman. You're a liar! Don't do that. Now, I, and I know, I know, I know. I was a high school principal, guys. I dealt with people going through this process. And what it boils down to is I am going to choose either the truth or what makes me comfortable. And that's a hard thing for a 15 year old. I don't blame 15 year olds. I blame the 40 year, old, 40 year olds at home, to be perfectly honest. Jesus Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1. Okay. John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So, Jesus <coughs> equals word equals truth. You shall not commit false witness against your neighbor. He is the living embodiment of this commandment. We don't lie. It reminds me of raising my son who, like most boys, went through uh, a phase of experimenting with the truth. And after several spankings and chastisings, you know, I sat him down. And I bet you to this day he can probably tell you this. I hope, I hope he shares it with his son when he has to. I said, Aaron, you need to understand something. As a clown, we don't lie, we don't cheat, and we don't steal. And then later on, I had to add, after he got in a fight with his sister, and we don't hit. But, you know, but that, that, that one gets a little, a little gray, because I'm not telling you you can't defend yourself and all that, you know, but he said it, okay? So I had to, I had to come up with something there, you know, you don't bite, you know, that kind of thing. All right? So you shall not bear false witness. And then finally, we've kind of come full circle here. The Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, 
or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Here we go. What's the principle? To covet something is to make an idol of it. Go all the way back to number one and number two. To covet something, to see it and say, ooh, I wish I had that. You have made an idol of it in your heart. Okay? <clears throat> to imagine taking it from another person. Okay, ooh, I, you know, I see that cow. I bet you I could sneak in there and get that cow out of the barn and bring it over to my backyard. And Chris would never miss it until the next morning when he looked in my backyard and saw it. Okay? To even think about doing that, I've broken another commandment, thou shalt not steal. Okay, see, all of these commandments interweave with one another. We should work, we should work proactively to help our neighbors prosper, to maintain and build on what he has so that God can be glorified through our neighbor and through us. That's the principle. It's not just about not looking at something and not desiring it or to take it from somebody. It's how can I help him keep that? How can I help him get more? How can I help him be a blessing to others in the name of Jesus Christ? How about that? So, as you read the Bible, you see many examples of thou shalt not, right? When you see these commandments, these rules, consider what principle is being taught. It's not just a rule. There is a principle for your life at work in the Word of God. Consider how the action being considered leads to holiness. How, how can I live this out? Because I don't have any plans to go and murder people. You'll be glad to know. Alright? But, how can I then live out thou shalt not murder in my own life be holy like my Father in Heaven is holy. And then pray for God's strength and His wisdom to lead your life in a way that is not only morally straight, right? Yes, we want to keep these commandments. But you want to live a life that seeks holiness in all of its ways. That's what the principles of the Ten Commandments can do. Amen.